morning. Welcome to our morning worship here at Bog Hall. I hope you're all bearing up and surviving. It's been a tough time, I know, for quite a lot of people. Our final session on Christian meditation took place last Sunday evening, and tonight at quarter past seven, we'll be leading a Tasey service, and that will be on Zoom. So if you'd like to take part, please get in touch and I'll give you the details for our Tasey service. Our tradition at Bog Hall is to call us to worship by the ringing of the bell. Robert was saying that for a drummer, Murray's ring, bell ringing can be quite inconsistent at times, so I think that was for you, Robert. This is our fourth Sunday of Easter, and this Sunday is known as Good Shepherd Sunday. It's time when we reflect on the image of Jesus as the Good Shepherd, a metaphor that was used throughout the Bible that kings were considered to be like shepherds. And kings who endangered their people were compared to bad shepherds. King David, I think, was probably the one who was considered as the Good Shepherd. You know, I think our relationship with the memory of King David is quite mixed. He was deeply flawed, but he was a successful warrior king. Under his rule, Israel came closest to being an empire, controlling the surrounding nations. But for much of Israel's history, it was the opposite way around. They were attacked by neighbours, subservient and taken into exile. David was remembered as much for his might as his wisdom. But Jesus turns this idea of the warrior king on its head. The shepherd must tend to his flock. The shepherd knows their names and they know the shepherd's voice. Known in that intimate relationship where the very sound of our voice is known. The psalm for today is unsurprisingly Psalm 23, The Lord's My Shepherd, a psalm that brings so much comfort to people. It's a psalm that reminds us that God is with us in the good times, the green pastures, the clear still waters, but also with us in the difficult times, the darkest of valleys, the valley of death. The generosity of the lush green pastures is evident all around us. We see it in the community groups and in the volunteering. And the cool healing touch of still waters, it's still here too. But we also need to feel that we are guided, helped through the dark times. This is a time when heads are getting messed with, where comfort is desperately needed, where moods can plummet to the darkest, deepest valleys. Hold on to that final line of this psalm. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. We translate God's goodness and mercy as following us, but it could equally be translated as stalking us. God stalks us. God is relentlessly after us not letting us go. God in the celebrations and God in the desperations. The 23rd Psalm, the Lord's my ship.
thank you for those who have written prayers for our service. Today I've got a prayer from May and I was sent two prayers from Andrew. So I'm going to run one of May's prayers and Andrew's prayer together to different people, two different generations. So let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. We give thanks for our family, friends and neighbours who have sustained us with their kindness in this dark time. We know that they are there with an uplifting smile. We are suffering isolation, but we know there is also hope in knowing that God is always with us. We thank the NHS in all departments for the work they are doing, and we know in the not too distant future the medical fraternity will find a cure for this virus. We thank our government ministers for giving us the information we need to lift our spirits and to know what is happening. This is a hard fight against an unseen killer, but our God will not abandon us. God always there. We thank our fighting forces for all their help the ordinary folks in the street who help when it is needed, and many others who work quietly in the background. Lord, we thank you for your care as we face being shut off from everyone, when all we want is to reach out and hug the ones who help us. Most of all, we thank you, Lord, for letting us know in many small ways that you are there, and that you will bring us through this trying time. Lord Jesus Christ, our guide and shepherd, you have given us everything we need. You are with us in the good times when we are in the place of green grass and pools of fresh water. We have not always kept to the right paths, and for this we are sorry. Renew us with your strength, so that we can see the guided path again. We'll now have a time of quiet to bring our own confessions to God. Even when we are in our deepest darkness, help us to not be afraid and trust in you that you will hold us in your hands and guide us back to rest in fields of green grass and calm. To bring us together with God, we will share the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. We continue looking at the first letter of Peter. I think it's a difficult letter to understand. And here the, the writer is seeking unity in the household, in the church and in the community. And the letter says some things about slavery which are really difficult. It was written to those who were slaves, those on the bottom rung of the ladder. And the writer says that they are now God's slaves. They are God's and no one else's. And although they are slaves, they are also free. They have been set free through Christ. In all that they do, Christ is to be their example. Reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For it is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, 
because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that, free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Amen. Jesus' teaching, all spiritual teaching, leads us to a different way of responding to outward threats and injustices. We tend to adopt the fight or flight response. If we are threatened, we threaten back, we fight. Or if we sense danger, we flee, we get away from the threat. Fight or flight, that response seems to be hardwired into us. And Jesus says it doesn't have to be that way. We can take what biblical scholars have called the third way. And Jesus is to be our example. He was abused, but he did not return abuse. He was threatened, but did not threaten back. Now this is not a passive walk all over me response. It is about not escalating the violence, the negativity, about not adding our own hurts and resentments to what is already out there. Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. they took this non-violent resistance into the political world but it's also there in the intimacy of parenting to this suffering patience. Perhaps suffering patience is in short supply at times. We all slip back into projecting our hurts and pains onto others. We all go astray. But we are reminded that by Jesus' wounds, we have been healed. Our wounds will heal too. And sometimes the wounds that we inflict on others, they can only begin to heal with forgiveness. I think that one of the greatest tools that we all have, a tool to stop the cycle of pain, abuse and resentment, is to pause. Pause before we reply. Pause before we press send. Sometimes it is the space in that pause that guides us back to the shepherd and guardian of our souls. Isn't that a great phrase? The shepherd and guardian of our souls. May the suffering servant shepherd and guard your soul. Our Gospel reading is from the Gospel of John and we have probably the least well-known of Jesus' I Am sayings. There are seven I Am sayings in John's Gospel. I am the bread of life. I am the light to the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection. I am the way. I am the vine. Any one of those would be more recognisable than today's one. I am the gate. Our good news comes from John's Gospel, chapter 10, reading from verse 1. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. 
The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Jesus certainly mixes up his metaphors. He is the gate and he is the good shepherd. You know, I'm feeling sorry for the Pharisees not getting what Jesus was on about. But I wonder what thoughts might arise from that image of Jesus as the gate. I'm pretty certain we'll have different thoughts about that today than we would a few months ago. Is it about Jesus protecting us from danger, danger from the outside? Or is it about Jesus welcoming us in? Or is it about Jesus letting us out? Jesus' parables can sometimes leave our heads spinning, trying to work out what they are saying to us today. There are a couple of scholars who have tried to explain the different way myths and parables work, how myths and parables, how they mould the way we understand the world in a different way. They say that myths help us to believe that seemingly irreconcilable people and situations can be brought together in peace and harmony. Most novels and films do this. Stories about how the irreconcilable are reconciled. The fairy tale Beauty and the Beast does just that. Look at all the contradictions in that story. Beauty and Beast, poor and rich, commoner and royalty, woman and man, captive and free. The story ends with these opposites reconciling. Peace, the story says, is possible. But parables, they do the opposite of myths. Parables force us to see the contradictions and not to just hope for reconciliation. They are unsettling and disruptive. Myths give stability to our story of how the world works and our place in it. But parables are agents of change. Myths allow us to dream of a better future. Parables prevent us living in a dream world. Doors do that too. Father Richard Rohr, he describes doors as liminal spaces, thresholds. Liminal space, he says, is an inner state and sometimes an outer situation where we can begin to think and act in new ways. It is where we are betwixt and between, having left one room or stage of life, but not yet entered the next. It is the space between being inside and being outside, between the old world left behind and a new one yet to be re revealed. They are disorientating places, but also places of growth and new creation, although they never feel like that at the time. Native Americans call liminal space crazy time. 
Crazy time is when nothing looks like it used to. Crazy time is the time of bereavement. It's a time of losing a job or losing our health. Crazy time might be a divorce or a global lockdown. It's anything that forces us out of the world as we have known it. And it leaves us spinning and disorientated. It feels horrible, but it is where God is, the God who leads us through the darkest of valleys. Jesus says, I am the door. I am here in your crazy time. But when we are in our crazy time, we go searching for our myths to try and make sense of how we are feeling, and they will not work. We try and work our way out, but we get stuck. There is nothing logical that works in crazy time. Nothing logical, but theological thinking. That can help. God thinking can help. I think that our normal way of trying to fix our crazy times is sort of like what Jesus said about those who do not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climb over the wall, the thieves and the bandits. Maybe they are like people who try to offer us easy ways out of our crazy time. They try to convince us that we do not need to go through the gate. They might offer us platitudes and false promises, but they never work. There is no other way but through the gate, through the suffering. Jesus says, I will lead you out through the gate, but beware of the thieves and bandits. They are stealing this God time from you. I know when we're in that darkness, that dark valley, it never feels like God time. It feels corrupt. God is there. This vulnerable place where we are hurt and broken is where we are also empty. We are opened and empty, ready for the presence of God. But it's a place where we need guides. We need those who can help us through our crazy time, through our dark valleys. Our reading ends with Jesus' words of comfort. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. To survive our crazy time means that the new life we find will have a new richness, a different sort of fullness. The worries, the obsessions that we had, they no longer control us in the way that they did. We have a new freedom as we become new creations. And we are never the same people as we were before. And our world is never the same as it was before. When we come through our doors, our crazy time, and hopefully we don't need to return like for like, abuse for abuse, insult for insult, We don't add our pain and grievances to the stockpile of pain in the world. We can absorb our pain in a new way because we know that God absorbs the pain of the world. God holds all these inconsistencies together. Father Rohr says that in this horrible time, this in-between time, God says, give me your broken, disfigured, rejected, betrayed body, like the body you see hanging on the cross, and I will make life out of it. It is so illogical that we only know this to be true when we have been led through the gate and find that we are being led to fresh pastures, 
and new beginnings. Broken hearts and new creations. Amen. My prayer of intercession was sent to me by Andrew. So let's turn once more to God in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, you are the shepherd. You guide us through these difficult times. Help us to keep you as our constant in these ever-changing times. Guide those in a position of power to do what is right and just for us and the country. Keep those who suffer at this time. And as the shepherd watches over his sheep, watch over them and guide them to meet full him. Lord, we ask you to guide the church both around the world and here in Volkhov. As we are apart, help us to keep the same sense of togetherness and fellowship as we share together in our own home. We pray for events that are happening around the world and those that are due to coronavirus, the increased need for food banks, so many having lost their income, so many also who have volunteered. Give all those who are in need at this time the strength to remain faithful to you and that you will be the shepherd that will guide us to follow the plan that God has for each one of us. And it's this time when we remember our brothers and sisters who are hurting and suffering. We take a time of silence as we carry them in our hearts and minds and in prayer raise them up to you. Lord, guide us as your sheep to a place of calm, where we can focus on you and your love for us to help us come in by the gate so that we may be saved by you. Amen. I'm going to have another fishy song. This is um, from Fishy's album and it's based on the Psalms and this is their take on Psalm 23, The Lord's My Shepherd. And as it's a fishy song, we have some actions, so I hope you'll all be doing those actions. It's good to hear uh, all the Thai cheers so that you're still doing all your exercises at home. So we have actions for the chorus and for the verse. So the first one is about God guiding us. So we're right, when we don't know where to go, you guide me. And that's God up there, and that's us. And God comes down and guides us. When I don't know where to go, you guide me. And the second one is you guard me, and that's us, and that's God. And God just comes round, and God wraps God's self around us, guards me. You guard me. And the last one is you grace me. We're asking for God's grace, God's blessing upon us. So the table's mine to share. And we're just going to open our hands and you grace me. And for the chorus, it says, your house will be my house too. So your house will be my house. And the sign we're using is just a connection. Your house will be my house too. A house where we feel that we belong, feel connected. And we use the same for the next line. Lord, I'm coming home to you. So let's sing, Coming Home to You by Fishy. <laughs> You got 
quite so loud. But that's good. Well, let's finish with a blessing. With the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May that blessing rest gently in your hearts and your homes on this day and forevermore. Amen.